I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, the outs, and the nitty gritty, so you could appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... Siegfried and Roy. Who were Siegfried and Roy? They were the greatest big cat entertainers of all time. They also revolutionized the industry of magic, put Las Vegas on the map, and built a career so outlandish, it seems like something out of a novel. The two German immigrants built themselves a version of the American dream that was more outlandish than any before or since. And the dizzying heights of their vision was only rivaled by the tragedy and darkness that would be dealt in equal measure. Enough hairspray to drown an adult panda. Ambition is a hell of a drug. It's something that once you get a little taste of, it can ruin your life. It propels you to do great things, and also is the ultimate downfall of most. Siegfried Fischbacher and Uwe Ludwig Roy Horn are inarguably the two single most successful big cat performers in the history of putting on shows involving big cats. Siegfried Fischbacher was born in Rosenheim, Bavaria, Germany on June 13th, 1939. His mother was a housewife and his father was a painter who, during World War II, was a prisoner of war of the Soviet Union. Interested in magic from a young age, in 1956, at roughly 17 years old, he moved to Italy and began to work in a hotel. Uwe Ludwig Roy Horn was born October 3, 1944, in Norderham, Oldenburg, Germany. His mother was a factory worker and his biological father died during the Second World War, while his stepfather was a construction worker. His family became friends with the people who ran the Bremen Zoo, giving him access to animals from a young age. Roy's first animal ward was a cheetah named Chico. He left school very young, roughly around 13. Soon after, he gained a job as a waiter on a cruise ship, which is where he met the man who would become his partner, Siegfried. You know, I just gotta say, I was, uh, I was, I was, I was on the phone earlier today. As a matter of fact, talking about, uh, I was setting up an appointment for a doctor thing, and they're going through and asking all these questions, these just like routine questions they have to ask for like the insurance stuff, and they're asking like, you know, have you ever had this kind of disease? Have you ever been diagnosed with this? And you know, you have to say, you have to answer it because if there was a thing that you if you did have some kind of disease or whatever, it would make your insurance worse or whatever fucked up bullshit goes on with our insurance in the United States. But then they start a- asking all these questions of like, have you ever, uh, do you, do you, uh, have you ever gone, uh, skydiving? Have you ever gone mountain climbing? Have you ever gone like, uh, deep sea diving all these questions and it's like no 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 and it's just like as you're answering it, you're just like man like i am fucking boring <laughs> i'm gonna get the best insurance ever because i i'm a i'm a risk-free asset and then you're reading this and you're just like my god like roy's just like all right i'm going to go to the zoo and wrestle with this cheetah and then i'm going to be on a cruise sh-. it's like by the time he was like At 13, I am the little 13 boy from Bavaria, and my best friend is a cheetah named Chico. What? He he just did crazy. He did crazier shit by like seventeen years old than I have still done to this day. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fucking insane. It really is. I mean, both of their lives are kind of like that. Um, and I think that's something that's really interesting about them, which we're I'm sure going to talk about at length. But the the idea that they were both from kind of very quotidian working class backgrounds, and then due to the circumstances surrounding the sev- the Second World War, had a fear of mortality instilled in them like from the jump where they were just like we could die at any second i guess let's go out and live life to the fullest fuck it let's have sex and play around with the cheetah like yeah for real for real i mean uh yeah i I think i I didn't even think about that but that's i think that's totally it you know just the growing up in the in like at the tail end of the war and living in post-war war germany where yeah it's like it's like where what where could we go like we can't go down any more than this like we already just lived through like 
the fucking just apocalypse so fuck it let's do whatever we want yeah it's really it's really impressive uh on on one level it's really impressive on another level it just is like it feels like you're tempting fate at every turn <laughs> like i it i feel like there's a way that you could probably achieve the same things that these two people achieved and take like 30 percent less risk but maybe that maybe not maybe that's you know i mean i think i think for sure but i but as to to your point you were just saying i think that that's kind of built into it is like when you've lived through such trauma you you just don't care as much It, it 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 reconditions your perception of what risk is because it's like fuck it like i just i saw some i saw some of the worst shit i've ever seen completely life-changing traumatic bullshit my life was in danger on like a daily basis there was always fear of uh, a, a, a a bombing in our in our city there were bombings people people that you know i there was friends and family members that i knew that were just killed in explosions it was a casual thing at some point like who gives a shit yeah so before we move on, I just want to talk briefly about like, I, I think prior to doing the research for this episode, my understanding of Siegfried and Roy was like, I think I thought they were magicians, maybe. And I knew there were cats around, but I didn't know that Roy was a big cat trainer and Siegfried was a magician and they teamed up together and did stunts where Roy would walk around with cats like lions and tigers and Siegfried would make them disappear or cut them in half or make them levitate. Like, I don't think that I knew that. I, I I mean, I was aware of who they were. Obviously, I knew the like showmanship, the kind of like flamboyant fashion, which quite frankly, I really like. I think it's really cool. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, we'll talk about that later. But like the set design alone, it's like some of the coolest shit I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, it's fucking amazing. Um, were you did you did you know that they had more clearly delineated roles? What was your experience with them? Do you, are you were you more familiar with them than me? Uh, I think maybe a little bit more familiar with them. But um, number one. So I, I, th- I think the idea, the delineated role roles and the fact that it was like what I'm a I'm a magician and I'm a animal trainer and like animal whisperer. And we're going to combine these skills and make this unique thing that never existed before. I think that's really cool. Like that, that, that immediately, just that information alone immediately made Siegfried and Roy much more compelling to me. Um, yeah, it's like if, it's like if Harry Houdini and Caesar Milan teamed up. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I love that you didn't laugh at that. You didn't, you didn't even give me the chuckle. You were just like, yep, mm-hmm, checks out, checks out. <laughs> Listen, man, when you've, when you've read some of his fan mail, you can't think about him the same way. That's true. You have to explain that though for the listeners. What does that mean? Uh, well, you've given me the key to the boy genius PO box so that I can yes. check it because you're too lazy to do that. And that was the thing yep. that, that was the thing that Andrew did. And you know, you're not going to do it now. Yep. The deep cuts PO box, as it turns out, happens to be the former PO box of Caesar Milan. So I, I have stacks of Caesar Milan's fan mail. Every time I, every time I go to the, the PO box, it's just Caesar Milan's fan mail. There's no, there's nothing for us. And the best part is that you're not making this up. Like this sounds like a bit that we would do. The only thing I'm making up is having read the fan mail because I have not opened it because that would be a crime. Right. That's a federal crime. You would never do that. Um, but no, so th- that was really cool to find out. I think I knew a little bit more about Sig- Siegfried and Roy than you, but very little. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, actually, I, I'm a, a fairly big fan of magic, or at least I used to be a lot. Like when I was a kid, I wanted to be a magician. Like that was one of the things that was one of the obsessions that I got off on. Like I I had I did like a, I did like magic shows in my backyard where like I made flyers and passed them out in the neighborhood and like had like actual like neighbors come and see magic shows that I did. Um, did you have an assistant or was it just you? No, you, no, no, no assistant. You gotta, you gotta have friends to have an assistant. <laughs> That's true. Right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and in terms of like magicians, like I, I wasn't the biggest magic head in the world. Uh, but you know, I was, I liked, you know, like 
David Copperfield, Penn and Teller, um, the Amazing Jonathan. I, I bet you love the Amazing Jonathan. Uh, I, I, I like the Amazing Jonathan. All right. Um, very, very tragic the way he died. But you know, I, I watched a couple of his specials, but I didn't. I wasn't like a huge fan of his. I wasn't a huge fan of like the comedy, which is actually kind of leading into what I was going to say. I'm not. I wasn't. I wasn't a huge fan of like the comedy thing. I, I really just liked straightforward magic. Have you ever been to the Magic Castle? It was great. Yeah, yeah, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit too. Um, but all to say that I never got into Siegfried and Roy, really. I mean, I was obviously very aware of them. They're kind of just a household name. Um, but I always thought of them, I guess, incorrectly as like they weren't really mu- magicians. The, the magician aspect of it was kind of more of a window dressing thing. And that in reality, kind of the way that Amazing Jonathan is, he was a magician. He wasn't a pretender or a charlatan. But his act was really not about magic. It was like the magic was a setup for punchlines that were comedic. Mm -hmm. Actually really do any particularly interesting magic. He was a comedian that just used magic as a prop. Um, And I kind of thought that that was what Siegfried and Roy was as well. Uh, I, I my interpretation of Siegfried and Roy was that they were they were kind of just a an animal stage show where like it was they were supposed to be magicians. But in reality, it was just kind of like choreographed animal stunts and things like that, which I wasn't particularly mm-hmm. interested in. And it's only now kind of realizing that it what that's not the case. It was actually kind of this hybrid of legit traditional magic and like animals being incorporated into the magic. And really extravagant shows, like tons of dancers, crazy set design, like I, I hadn't I, I like I said, going into this, I was just vaguely aware of them in their in their cultural standing, but I I, I'm way a fan at now, especially after learning about like how weird their relationship was. And like, like I just, ass- I, I don't know why I assumed this, but I always just assumed that they were just like an out gay couple who like hung out with lions. That's, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I thought it was too. Like I said, I thought, I thought that the show was just kind of like, it was light magic light, but in reality it was just kind of like animal stunts. And they just yeah. like were on stage with like tigers, like running around and stuff like that. Like that's kind of what I thought it was. I'm, I'm way more into it though with how dark and fucked up it is and how the fact that they like live together for like 40 years, but like never really confirmed or denied anything, which is very sad on one level and also kind of interesting to me on like a, yeah, you don't need to have other people define you. Like just be your Liberace lion tamer self, man. The secret origin of these two men is quintessentially Freudian. Siegfried claims that his home was not a loving one, and that his father never even spoke to him until one day he did a magic trick. Siegfried claims, What's the deal with all these tigers? (laughs) The tiger bit me, Jerry! He bit me in the face! (laughs) Siegfried claims that his home was not a loving one, and that his father never even spoke to him until one day he did a magic trick in the house making a coin disappear. And his father, in shock and amazement, uttered, how did you do that? This dark and twisted motivation spurred the two performers in more ways than one. They literally and metaphorically incorporated this trauma into their act. In the book, Mastering the Impossible, they wrote, It was then that we began to delve into our childhoods. There's a powerful link between our reality and our magic. For our reality, even at its darkest, is the source of our magic. That sounds like a joke of just like, oh, it's he's doing a funny voice to read this. But like, that's literally the narration in this movie literally sounds like that. It's an impersonator. It's It's a a, it's like an impersonator that's doing like a kind of not good impersonation. And it really sounds like that. Let's let's listen to a little bit of the behind the magic special. I think it was a Dateline or a 2020 special behind the magic. It sounds a little strange. I never felt love in my life. Only on stage. The applause, the acceptance. You've been in each other's lives for 50 years. 55 years. What's your relationship with Roy? What does he mean to you? All these years we're together, what we achieved. I said, I thank you very much. And I think I said, I love you. So, and he says, if I would have to do it again, I would do everything again the same way. I regret nothing. 
Siegfried and Roy are the ultimate showmen. They set Vegas on fire. Siegfried and Roy had been the single most successful entertainment attraction in Las Vegas history by orders of magnitude. 30 years, 48 weeks a year, capacity business. Siegfried is a magician that comes along once in a generation. Always designing and creating new illusions, magical feats that had never been tried before. When I see the wonderment in the eyes of the audience, and when the performer and the audience became one, it's very gratifying. Roy is the big animal lover. That's what brings him to life. <laughs> that is Roy literally bareback riding Roy, a fucking like tiger. Like a pro. He had no fear of living, not fear of loving, and no fear of giving. The scary element is fundamental to it. Siegfried and Roy with penguins would not work, right? You need the fear that's inherent. I don't know. I would, I would watch Siegfried and Roy with penguins. That sounds pretty cool. Roy was always bigger than life. True magic begins with reverence for the circle of creation. Creation. Siegfried is the one who has to say, how is this going to work? Ah, now, these one time of my life. Oh, I'm right here, I'm right here. Siegfried often says that he by himself would be not enough. It's never enough. And Roy by himself would be too much. I get that good feel, it's never enough. But to me, it's like thunder and lightning. The Siegfried Roy story is the American dream story. It's pretty inspiring to think that you can come. Siegfried, he kind of sounds like uh, like like a, a middle ground between Arnold Schwarzenegger and Werner Herzog. <laughs> you know what he sounds like? Siegfried sounds like the second person in line to play a Bond villain. You know, like so sometimes those Bond movies, like they have like superstars playing the villains. And sometimes they've got like, you know, the guy from World is Not Enough, the English guy who played not Rupert Murdoch, where you're like, oh, yeah, that guy. He's la he's one of those Bond villains where you're like, oh, yeah, Siegfried. Hello, Mr. Bond. I would like to now shove you into this giant pit of tigers. I mean, imagine if they made a James Bond movie where the where the villain was like a stage magician. I mean, I would I would love if Siegfried and Roy played a uh, a dual t eco terrorist or something. We must wipe off the the southern hemisphere of the United States because we must convert it into a cheetah preserve. Yeah, I mean, the uh, Deant were were in Chappie playing those characters and. Kiss made all those movies where they were just like superheroes. Like Siegfried and Roy could have been just Wayne, dude. Wayne, Wayne Newton. Wayne Newton is in a Bond movie. Wayne Newton is a Bond villain. Like Madonna is in a Bond movie. There's no way that they're worse than Madonna. <laughs> Siegfried and Roy as themselves as Bond villains. I 100 percent the missed opportunity of of all life. It really is. It really is. After working on the Brem on the, uh, the this cruise line together called Brem the Bremen, um, they they started performing in magic shows. Uh, basically, uh, they Siegfried was on the cruise line as a magician, and Roy was there, and they kind of became friends. Roy was like working on the show as like a hand or you know a behind the scenes person at first, and then. Um, <laughs> It's so crazy. You can't even believe that it's real. But when Roy went on this cruise line when he was 17, he smuggled his pet cheetah onto the ship. Which, first of all, you have to say that, like, when he was working at the zoo, the cheetah that he befriended, Chico, he just, like, took it. Like, he just, he's yeah, like, this he is my it. cheetah now. Like, and yeah. then, and then, and then. He had it on this cruise ship and was just like hiding it. And then Siegfried was like doing magic shows and he was like, and he was like, Hey, what, did you like the magic show? 
And Roy was like, it was all right, but it'd be cooler with a cheetah. And Siegfried was like, yeah, I guess that's a weird random thought, but sure, it'd be cooler with a cheetah. And then he's like, come here for a second. And then he just like went into his room and there was just a cheetah. Just a full on fucking cheetah hanging out. (laughs) I can't even imagine. Like, can you imagine what that would be like? You're you're like 20 years old, 17 years old. However the fuck old Siegfried is. You've got your first like touring magic show. You've like this your your first real job in your career. You're on a cruise line. You're away from your family, but you're like, I'm doing it. I'm pursuing my dream. You meet this kid and he's like, yeah, your show of us cool, but like cheetah. And you're like, yeah, right. Like you've got a fucking cheetah in your room. Okay, kid. Okay. Come back to my room and I'll show you this cheetah. And he's like, uh, is cheetah code for something? All right, let's go. They go back to the dude's room, and it isn't code. It's a literal, live cheetah. He's like, oh my gosh, that wasn't code. And he's like, oh, but I still want to (laughs) fuck. No, no, it was. Cheetah is code for fucking, but uh, I also, in addition, have a cheetah. In fact, I completely forgot about the cheetah whenever I said that. I I was oh, I got, I opened the door, and I was like, oh, I said cheetah, and the cheetah, oh, I see what he thinks. Yeah, yeah. But they, so basically from here... They start performing together, right? They, they start doing a, a magic box trick, you know, where you put something into a box, the head's showing, oh, the thing disappears. What? Oh my God, that's crazy. And like, they do that with the cheetah and they have an act. And that's when Siegfried and, and Roy is born uh, on this cruise line. Which is kind of, I, I think that's really interesting and kind of cool. I, I I like the idea of, you know, the a lot of times, the, so the, there was a there was a documentary that came out on Disney Plus about the Beatles, which was directed by Peter Jackson, and it was like this multi-hour, multi-part long documentary about the making of the album Let It Be, and basically how the whole thing was just like they agreed to do this like stunt where they would like write an album in a warehouse in a couple weeks and then perform it in some big tele uh filmed concert that would become like a movie i like that you're i like that you're explaining this like we all haven't watched this like i don't even i don't even like the beatles and i watched all nine hours of this thing there's people that there's people that don't know who the beatles are i'm, I'm doing it for you trey thornton <laughs> That guy, that listener, Trey Thornton, I love that guy, but I can't really imagine what it would be like to be like a recurring weird supporting character in a podcast. You know what I mean? But yeah, so so this documentary that a lot of people have seen except for Trey Thornton and uh, there's a particular moment where uh, John Lennon is just hasn't showed up. He's just not there. And, uh, it's like early in the morning and, uh, uh, Paul and Ringo and George are just sitting there and, uh, George and Ringo are just kind of like doing nothing. And, uh, cause they kind of don't care, but Paul is like freaking out. Cause he's just like, we got to fucking write an album. Like what's going to happen? Uh, not unlike the process of like th- that, that doc, that whole documentary is weirdly cathartic and relatable because it was basically just writing the musical episode um for andrew yeah f- yes for for andrew but uh, there's a moment where he's sitting there and he's kind of like just messing around and then over the course of this one shot he starts out messing around with this song and it's just kind of like nothing and then over the p- over the span of like of like a couple minutes whatever it is somehow hits upon get back like he figures out the chord progression and then he's like messing around with a melody and it's like completely different. And then slowly it becomes the melody for get back. And then he kind of like in the span of like three minutes, he just kind of like finds get back. And there was like a weird discourse about that specific moment on the Internet where there was like a bunch of people, specifically one viral post that was just like, it's astonishing to watch Paul McCartney just pull get back out of the ether. Like the 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 work that you can see just the genius happening where he just like finds this classic song in like three minutes or whatever and then there's like a counter pushback to that where people are just like the beatles aren't that aren't they the beatles fucking suck they're just like a basic band they're not that cool they just made like shitty basic music and like this isn't impressive um this is just like how writing music works um and i i think that i think that in my opinion it's somewhere in the middle where i'm i'm a i'm a i'm a huge beatles fan 
Um, I'm definitely not the, one of the people who are just like Beatles aren't that good or whatever. Um, and I do think that watching that moment is kind of objectively fascinating to watch somebody figure out a song like that. However, as somebody who makes music similarly to Andrew, um, that really is how it is that, that there's like this weird layer of like mystique around these types of things. And you, you know, this the skill versus talent and all that stuff. And people believe that these things are like these magical processes that happen. Um, but in reality, the things are a lot more mathematical and kind of j- process based. And that really just kind of is how writing a song is. You sit there and you just like mess around with something and then you just like accidentally figure something out and you like it. And then you're just like, I, fi- I figured out I, I, I was kind of like messing around and I just kind of, I kept tweaking it until I got something I liked. And then it's good. It, it really is just kind of a, a process that happens. And I love the idea of the fact that this wasn't some genius idea that they plucked out of the ether. It wasn't like Siegfried and Roy being like, I know what we'll do. Animals and magic. And it also wasn't some like Hollywood executive like pitching ideas and, you know, throwing out millions and millions of ideas until they hit upon the, the golden ticket. It was neither of those things. It was literally just like they it was it it was like circumstantial. They were just like, we're in this ship. You have a cheetah. I'm doing a magic show where I'm making things disappear. It's just the logical conclusion of what we would do. Pin pineapple apple, whatever that song is. Yeah. And it was an amazing idea that worked very well, but it wasn't like some genius thing, some vision. And it also wasn't some like cynically generated Hollywood idea. It was just like, obviously, we're going to do this. Like, what, like, what else are we going to fucking do? It, it insists upon itself. Yeah. And then it was like, and then it was like a great idea and it worked. It like just, it just worked really well. I, I love that idea that, 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 that concept is really, is really interesting to me. So this, this, we're watching footage from a movie called Siegfried and Roy, the magic box, which they self produced and was a direct to VHS feature film where they, we're basically like kayfabing their own story and it's all about like the trials and tribulations that they went through and how they got into magic and it's them like playing themselves talking to kids about magic and, and there's also a show it's it's so crazy something how do you do it do what exactly it's magic <laughs> Roy is just standing there holding a fucking tiger. Deep within us all, the child remains alive. Oh, and the whole thing is narr- narrated by Anthony Hopkins. Curiosity, adventure, fascination. These are the magician's tools to help us awaken, to remember. Future. For Siegfried and Roy. He's opening a silver their box. Memories, their stories. Exist within the magic box. Yeah. 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 Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. This is some psychedelic imagery that can't even be described. Bright in the forests of the night. So good. What immortal hand <laughs> Tiger head. So now we've transitioned from in what the, the kids deep sky talking to uh, fire of thine eye. <laughs> Siegfried and Roy. And we're just watching basically like a taped live see. performance version of their stage show. Yeah, this is like this is like Tarsum mixed with Wes Anderson mixed with like fucking they're wearing silver bedazzled suits and giant silver capes, and Roy has a cod piece that is like rivaling the Goblin Kings from Labyrinth. They really do just they look like characters from a a, a movie adaptation of some Marvel comic book comic book property from the eighties. Their entertainers who have performed live feats of magic for millions and millions of people. Like this is just this is just fucking amazing. Like I don't even care about them doing magic. 
I just, I just want to see this. Why wasn't Siegfried cast as Magneto? Like, that just is Magneto. He's German, he's got a giant cape, he's theatrical, a weird white mullet. And dream. But with each journey, that's the better timeline. Also comes the story. We're not there. This footage is amazing. Like, this is, like, genuinely cool to me. <laughs> in the timeline where Siegfried played Magneto in some 80s X-Men movie, that there no pandemic happened there. God. So that's where we're going. We're, 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 that's where we're going, right? We're going to the land of Siegfried and Roy ruling, ruling the world. But right now, we're still with them as performers oh i thought you meant like we are going to figure out how to break through into the other dimension and live there where they are siegfried and, there's there's no pandemic and siegfried and roy are still alive and they're just like they've been unanimous un, unanimously voted as like emperors of earth yeah 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 and they're like completely benevolent leaders they're, they haven't been corrupted by power thing is great we live in a utopia a Sigtopia, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so basically, you know, they, that's that's where we're going. But we're 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 still with them. They're young men. You know, we're 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 doing the Quentin Tarantino order for this one, right? We're we're jumping back and forth in time. And uh, so they leave this cruise line, having made a little bit of a name for themselves. They they start touring all over Europe, and they perform this act where they make Chico disappear. Um, you know, they do it a lot, and they make the they make a name for themselves while touring all over Europe until they finally find a position at a casino in Monaco, where they they have a, a regular show and they just basically perform there like all week. Um, and Monaco at this time was like just at the very tip of being like a really world renowned like tourist destination. Um, Grace Kelly had just married Prince Rainier. And so the country was like on the rise for, on the cultural stage. And um, so in some ways it's kind of dumb luck. And in some ways Siegfried and Roy are just like, they've found a way to perfectly position themselves to really take off um, because there's a lot of Western celebrities and Western um, political diplomats and people in positions of power that are going to Monaco. Um, and they, they kind of are like, it's a, it's, I don't even know what the equivalent would be, but it's, it's like the equivalent of, I don't know, Ibiza or something today, where it's like a place that people go to on holiday from the West that has like a kind of foreign locale, uh, mystique to it. And, um, they, their act gets so popular. Um, at this Monte Carlo nightclub that they get invited to perform for a gala of international celebrities at um, like this this big kind of uh, European meets American publicity event, basically. Like there's a bunch of like actual celebrities there. It's not just, you know, oh, it's the diplomat's second cousin. It's like fucking, you know, like I said, Grace Kelly and... Uh, huge movie stars that are there in Mo in Monte Carlo because Monte Carlo starts to become this tourist destination. And the next day after they have they, after they do their show with Chico at the at the this event, they are basically in papers across the world and they're they're given the nickname the Kings of Monte Carlo. So like that one show, you know, five of those celebrities told their publicists who told people and they were just everywhere. And so they kind of really had this momentum going for themselves but not being satisfied with that slash you know being the 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 ever elite showman duo they realize they kind of have to go to america and if if they want to make it big so they pick las vegas in the 1960s uh they quickly found themselves with the show and for context this is before Las Vegas was the magic capital of the world. Uh, it, it was more kind of like nightclub scenes, the the kind of vestiges of the uh, the Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr. Rat Pack era. You know, it was kind of like jazz bands, cigar filled uh, bar nightclub arena uh, scenes. It wasn't what we think today of like, oh, we're going to go to Las Vegas and see a show of a bunch of people doing can can dances and magic or whatever. And they, yeah, and they were basically like rejected multiple times in the beginning where like they were in Monaco and they got all this heat on them. 
and they had these American celebrities that were like freaking out and huge fans and saying that they were great. So they're just in their minds. They're like, oh, we, we're going to go to Vegas and we're just going to like the same thing is going to happen. Everybody's going to react to us the way that these people reacted to us when we did our shows here. And we're just going to be huge stars. And then they went to Vegas and everyone was like, like what? Like we don't want, lo- lo- we don't like magic. Like that's fucking stupid. And, and they couldn't find a job for a little bit. And then they just kept trying. And I guess apparently they just, been, at some point they just got a break or whatever it was. It, it was kind of vague on like how they sort of ended up getting a job somewhere. It, it just kind of says that at some point they did. Um, and that, yeah. And then they got a job and it went from there. Yeah. So over the next decade, basically from the sixties to the early seventies, they, they kind of use that as their like building time where they're making money. They have these shows. And they have this kind of niche, right? They have this this gimmick that they always do, which is magic plus animals, magic plus animals. So they they start getting more animals. They start getting a few more big cats. And they they really start kind of generating awareness for themselves in America. Um, And I know we've kind of said it already, but I just want to reiterate that like magic in the States was not a fucking thing in the 60s. Nobody gave a shit about like card tricks or making a fucking you know person saw in half like they just it wasn't something that was culturally cool to anybody but Siegfried and Roy really started to gain traction because of the animal side of it Americans really responded to the animal thing and then once they came for the animals then they got like their minds blown for the magic so let's watch their their first tv appearance in the 1970s Spectacular magic of Siegfried and Roy has so enthralled audiences that they have been voted uh, in Las Vegas the Las Vegas Entertainment Award as the most outstanding act in show business for four consecutive years. They have a a breathtaking act. It features a five-year-old African lion, a 650-pound Bengal tiger, and a snarling two-year-old black panther. And tonight our cameras have been permitted inside the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, where in a special live appearance you will now see the two superstars of magic, Siegfried and Roy. That was Dick Cavett doing the intro. <laughs> Truly the most Cavets of dicks. Uh, Siegfried and Roy looking very 70s out. They're, uh, they're, they're clipping uh, <laughs> handcuffs to Roy's hands. Oh man, they're so 70s right now. Roy like looks older than he does later on with that muscle and the haircut. Yeah. And they just put him in a sack. And then uh, Siegfried is now going to close this giant box and lock it. And he's locking it. The flourishes, man. Flourish game on point. And he's got a giant rope. He's pulling the rope. Tying the rope around the box. Now he's gonna pull a little thing, whatever the fuck that thing's called. It's got this shower curtain like structure. Oh! And now Roy has appeared! And Siegfried has disappeared. Roy was in the box and Siegfried was on top of the box. He covered himself and then Roy appeared in his place. And now Roy is opening the box. And I think I think we know where this is going. Yeah, I, I think so. Wow, his movements are so dramatic. He's doing it with his whole body. Wow. And he's going to open the box and... What... Siegfried is tied in there and he's handcuffed. How is that possible? And he's got a different jacket on. And that was the first time Siegfried and Roy were on TV. Another thing about this that might not be immediately obvious to anybody, just given context and time, is 
um, at this point in the 70s, um, in addition to the idea of incorporating animals, um, the speed of their magic was unprecedented. Like no, nobody was yeah. doing magic at this with this like sort of like stunt like feel, um, really big movements and really fast tricks that were kind of. The, the, uh, a part of the appeal of the trick is just the, 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 um, rapid fire nature of it. Um, most, mo- most conventionally ma- magic before this was very slow and methodical. And it was kind of like, you know, it was kind of like if you watch the, the, um, the prestige, like the difference between the Hugh Jackman character show and the Christian Bale character show where the Christian Bale character show was very kind of like slow and quiet and methodical. And then the Hugh Grant was like Hugh Grant, the Hugh Jackman was the big kind of showy guy. Um, magic was kind of like very much like slow and kind of like showing you processes and letting you kind of like take it all in. That was kind of what magic was. And they, they like, they put the five X speed on it basically. And it's very satisfying to watch. Like it's really, really cool. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, sim- it's at, and, and you know, watching that kind of slower methodical close up magic, like we were talking about the magic castle earlier and, a lot of the, you know, the, a lot of the magic shows, um, a lot of the magicians in the shows that you can see at the magic castle are very traditional. Like th- those are people who are sort of schooled in the old school, like, you know, 1800s style of, of close up magic and, and, um, uh, illusionist, uh, tricks. And that's not, I, I like that. It's not bad. It's, 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 um, it's really cool to watch that kind of more methodical magic. But, um, the incorporating the speed and the stunt like quality to it, uh, it's like, it's, it's almost like half of the appeal of it. It's like, oh, the, not only is it the magic and the allu- are not only are the magic and the illusions interesting and cool, but just like the acrobatic quality of the show is part of the appeal. So during this time, our friends, Sigfried and Roy, they decided to get a little experimental, decided to shake it up. So what do they do? They add a third. But no, not like that. A third person like an assistant. But also maybe like that. Who knows? This person's name was Lynette Chappelle, and she was a classically trained ballet dancer. Chappelle became a human prop in many of their shows. Being sawed in half, floating up in the air, you get the idea. She didn't become a mainstay of the act, however. She moved into a behind-the-scenes capacity eventually, becoming the head coordinator of the soon-to-be-launched Siegfried and Roy Enterprises, Incorporated. And then things started to become complicated between Earth's greatest showmen. The stress of producing these high-pressure shows started to get to Roy. He became erratic and difficult to deal with. While Siegfried, racked with anxiety over the shows, and Roy, began taking Valium in order to combat his increasing insomnia. As their drug addictions and increasingly combative relationship spiraled out of control, they debated quitting show business altogether. Hmm, interesting. The compounding stress of a weekly, high-intensity show caused one of this duo to become increasingly erratic, while the other one became increasingly anxious. A rift was driven between them. And it led to them considering quitting for good. Interesting indeed. Act two. So you want to be a lion tamer. 1989 was the year everything changed for Siegfried and Roy. Steve Wynn, a Las Vegas media mogul, decided to build the Mirage on November 22, 1989. Soon after, he also opened Treasure Island. However, the Mirage is the casino that would change Vegas and Siegfried and Roy's lives forever. Siegfried and Roy came to me with the idea of a new show that was going to be scaled above and beyond anything that anyone had seen in Las Vegas. That room at the Mirage was built for them, a place to keep elephants and tigers. You know, it was a zoo. The equipment that it took to do the illusions, the staging devices, and other paraphernalia, very, very elaborate, very tricky. Takes a lot of money, I'll tell you that. It's probably the most expensive show ever in the history of the world at the time it was built. Over $30 million. In Giant in animatronic dragon. Money ...to spend on a theater, but on top of it, Siegfried and Roy were making a big salary. They inked a deal for $57 million over five years. At the time, it was the 
biggest contract anybody had ever signed in Las Vegas. We get the set designer John Napier, who did all the Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals, a star like Express Cats, and Miss Saigon is a star of set design. When we finally got him and we talked about it, the show, what it's supposed to be, and we say, how I can do a show when I, there is no script? I say, we are the script. I had to create a series <laughs> of small and large vignettes. I love your energy, Siegfried. That doesn't make any sense, but I love your energy. So it was a suit of... I'm on board. ...of Marvel Comics and, and Wagner. Nothing, nothing sums up my interests more than somebody saying, it's like a mixture of Wagner and Marvel Comics. I'm like, what? I say, what? That's pretty, that's pretty accurate, honestly. Yeah. Even down to the fact that, like, I'm, I'm not joking. In that, in the, the, that concert footage of Siegfried and Roy from that, from the Magic Box movie, the costumes they're wearing and just their general look, they look like characters from one of those, like, comic book movies in the 80s, you know, Masters of the Universe or, like, just, it, it looks like they literally, they, they could have come out of that movie. Yeah, but it's way better because they're gay. Like, I love, I, I'm really genuinely kind of surprised that I haven't uh, been interested in them in the in the past. I don't think I knew that they were this cool. Like, I'm I'm so, like... Oh man, I feel like I've fucked up my entire life. Like these guys are so amazing. Like I said, I like, like I told you before, I was I was always turned off or kind of slightly disinterested in them simply because I kind of I chalked them up almost in like a pretentious way. I chalked them up of like they, it wasn't like real magic. It was kind of like light magic light, but it was mostly just an animal stunt show, which I just had no interest in, which wasn't which wasn't true. But that's kind of always how I thought of them. Yeah, I just I'm I'm so, so into them. Um, so if you couldn't tell from that clip, uh, the basic aesthetic is like it's a it's a Broadway musical, a magic show and a rock concert all rolled into one. Um, they took magic shows standards like the box cut levitation and the disappearance all flowing into one another instead of just doing them trick by trick. Like that was, that's one of the things they were also known for it is not like you were saying earlier about the speed and the pace of their, their performances. They weren't doing just this is a trick and then this is a trick and then this is a trick. They were, they would have the tricks be like Russian nesting dolls. So they would all like flow into one another. Like they, they would, so they would put somebody in a box, cut them in half, and then they would make the two halves of the box float up in the air, come back down, put it together. And then they would, in the moment where you would normally have the person come out of the box, they would make the box and the person inside it disappear completely. And in a lot of ways, they kind of set the precedent for that increased speed and, and, and increased uh, demand by the audience for more tricks per minute or per second mm-hmm. or whatever um, and, a, and, a, and a faster pace because even that first just based on our current expectations like when you watch a magic show that like that's kind of the format the format is like we'll do a couple tricks that are like pretty cool but when we really flourish and when we really wow the audience is when we get to that point where we do this trick that's like five tricks that are just dovetailing out of one another to the point where you just like, you're just like, my, your mind is blown because it's like, it's a trick upon a trick upon a trick upon a trick. Like that is kind of the expectation now. When you see a magic show, like you're waiting for that. You're waiting for the like five layers deep trick that just blows your mind. And even that original, when we watch that footage of their first television appearance, even then in the 70s, even that was a little bit too slow to where you're just like, I get it. He's in the box. Like you, you get ahead of the trick where Siegfried is on top of the box. He lifts the thing. Roy replaces him. And then they go through the motions of the whole rest of the trick where he gets down and undoes the box. And even then you're kind of just like, uh, he's in the box. I get it. Like you're, you're like, you're a little bit impatient because now magic is so much about the like, you can't keep track of it. It's just rapid fire one after the other. And it's like, you know, it's it's like the 30 rock, like a million jokes a second type pace um, where you just you just have to be continually hit 
with things or else you you get ahead of it. Siegfried and Roy quickly became the highest grossing act in the history of Las Vegas. They skyrocketed to the top of America's celebrity elite, which is just unfathomable when you think about the fact that the two were gay men that hung out with tigers and made doves disappear, only in America. They rose to the ranks of American pop culture and eventually even became international superstars. They bought every house on the block that they lived on and built a massive compound. They bought upwards of 50 animals, including five extinct in the wild white tigers. Throughout the 90s, they're basically on top of the world. They start their own production company and sell VHS tapes of their shows and even produce content based on their personas. Case in point, 1996's Siegfried and Roy, Masters of the Impossible. Here we be on Secret Roy Possible And the kindling's been set a place the mages Andrew, what are we watching right now? What is this? We're watching an animated Siegfried and Roy series, which so far is just a series of of static uh, static images. With like, okay, now we're now we're getting the animation. They kept what was good and locked up the bad. For some reason, that guy with like a really bad Irish accent is the narrator. But now begins a new chapter, a tale never told. How Siegfried and Roy in a snow tiger quite bold become undying friends and face darkness and fire. <laughs> this is amazing. They had a full on animated TV show. And it looks, it's kind of, it's got the, it's got the, the style and aesthetic of. Uh, Pirates of Dark Water, that show Pirates of Dark Water. It, it reminds me, it must be the same animation studio or something because it looks the same. It was produced by Deke Entertainment, which I believe actually is the Pirates of Dark Water. Yes. Should this book fall into the wrong hands, all hope will be lost. Why is he it's Irish? Weird. Yeah, it's weird. There was a. There was a. a whole trend in the 90s and 80s where celebrities got animated TV shows but the celebrities wouldn't voice themselves do you remember like Jackie Chan Adventures or like Mr. T like it's really strange that they didn't voice themselves but sire this is folly you know the year of darkness hell yes he did why was he (laughs) Irish why did they make I don't, I don't know. I don't know. So the show was produced by Deacon. Or- it's not even like it was a good Irish accent. Like I would get it. It's like, okay, nobody can do a, a, a German accent around here, but this guy is Irish. So I guess we'll just do that. But, but the Irish accent was also terrible. It was clearly just an American guy or Canadian guy doing a shitty Irish accent. Uh, so the, pr- the show was produced by Deke Entertainment and aired on Fox Kids. Uh, Andrew. Don't look at the script. How many episodes do you think of that show aired? Three. Close. Four. Four episodes aired. <laughs> I mean, that that's not surprising at all because it's, the, it's really kind of like this. I mean, just from that little bit of watching it, like a, a cartoon, especially in the 90s, has to have a high concept. It's got to have like the what's the thing about this? Who's the hero that the kids are going to like or what's the high concept? Ninja Turtles, like they're ninjas. They fight with like ninja weapons uh, and they're mutant turtles. Um, But like the high concept for Siegfried and Roy is that they're like magicians that like do crazy uh, magic with animals or whatever. But the show had like it wasn't. It's not a it's not like a superhero show. There's there's literally. Do you remember the the French animated show called The Magician that aired on Fox Kids? That is more of a Siegfried and Roy show than this show. This show is like a fantasy show where you're in like a fake land and like Siegfried and Roy are like Robin Hood style guys like in the land doing stuff with with like magic that's like, you know, lasers and, you know, incantations. Whereas the the French show, The the Magician, is about a superhero vigilante who doesn't have superpowers, but has like magic themed abilities so he can like make stuff disappear with sleight of hand and like he's really strong and stuff i don't actually remember that much about the show but i did watch it and i remember liking it but it's definitely more of a siegfried and roy show than this piece of shit (laughs) 
As the two men began to age, and as the 2000s rolled around, they tried to slow down just slightly. They only did eight performances a week. And then, in 2003, the horrible worst-case scenario that we've all been dreading happened. A tiger attacked Roy. On October 3rd, 2003, the destiny that Roy had been thumbing his nose at for close to 40 years finally caught up with him. I'd say 15 minutes before it started, sat down. But we were dead center right in front of the stage. We knew we had good seats. We didn't know we had the best seats in the place. Andrew and Paul are seated at a table in row It's a weirdly F, morbid thing to say. Feet, yeah, I thought the same thing. Stage. I was like, are you yeah, implying that like they were the best the seats because you got to see Roy being mauled up close? Animals. animals are right on top of the audience. This is dangerous. You can't look away. It's impossible to look away because there, there's tigers that are, you know, 20 feet away from you on stage. And the audience loved it. They just loved it. I mean, because they could touch them. Hello. Most of the show, there's actors and actresses everywhere. There's, there's animals everywhere. 45 minutes into the show, the lights go off and there's just a spotlight on Roy Horn. He just walks out, just the tiger. And you introduce the tiger. This is Mama Go, and tonight is his first appearance in front of an audience. <laughs> and then said it was the tiger's first time on stage in front of an audience, which we have since learned is part of the show. They say that every time. It's a little gimmicky thing to make the audience feel good and that they were special to be at that show. <laughs> Someone you like? <laughs> When, you know, Montecor is doing this show every night. It's a little showbiz, a little white lie, we might call it. In any of these illusions, uh, timing is everything. Roy kneels down, Say hello to everyone. puts the microphone in front of the animal's face so that the audience can hear the animal growl. Then Roy stands up, the tiger jumps up, puts his front paws on Roy's shoulders, and gives Roy a kiss. When Roy introduced the manticore, and he does his things, what he did 150,000 times. For some reason, this time, manticore comes out and he misses his mark on the stage. Now, there's a lot of disagreement as to what happened next and why. And there is tape of the incident, but the hotel has steadfastly refused to release it. The one thing that is clear is that that night changed Siegfried and Roy forever. What happened was the animal got confused. Montecourt got confused. I've been in a situation where Tiger is confused as to what he's being asked. And that night, that particular night, something was different in Montecor's brain that then said, mm, uh, not tonight. And Roy gave him a tap on the head, which is a secondary command to obey. And the animal reached up with its mouth and took Roy's hand and pushed it away. The tiger reached around to the right and grabbed his right wrist. I saw that. And I immediately thought that didn't look too good. And it kind of nipped at his hand. He smacked at it. But once the music abruptly stopped, we these stopped, CGI I recreations, kind of quiet. they're amazing. I sensed something was wrong. Roy knew that this was completely off script. This was way out of line. So Roy knows what you always do is you distract the tiger. So he took the microphone with a soft rubber tip and he hit him on the side of the head which you could hear because the microphone was on over the PA system. The sound was just so loud, pow, pow, pow. At some point, the tiger has to decide if he wants to listen to this person or not. At that point, Roy fell over the right front paw of Montecor on his back. He fell on the stage. He fell on stage. And then, of course, I saw, oh my God, Roy is in trouble. Big trouble. Because while nothing has ever happened before, Montecor is a 400 pound tiger, and he has Roy completely at his mercy. So basically, what happens from here is, is Montecor lunged out at Roy and then bit him in the neck, and it like severed an artery 
and Roy was paralyzed from one half of his, like the right half of his body was paralyzed. He almost bled to death. And um, like he straight up almost died, which is just on one level shocking and surprising and on the other level completely expected, you know? Yeah, the the, the number one, I, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe they still do things like this. But one of the things I thought like watching this footage and stuff is like I feel like they wouldn't do a show like this now where there's just like these tigers just like out in the open, no barrier between the audience, like thing, the safety protocols for things are much more strict and regulated now. And so, you know, like you said, it's like, it's almost kind of crazy that it never happened before. It wasn't some horrible accident, like in from the sixties to 2003, there was never any serious, nobody ever got hurt or killed. It's almost that's almost the surprising thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's surprising that it was Roy and not just like some shitty tourist with like a flash camera that like scared one of the lions or, you know, somebody backstage who was shitty and was not Roy. Because like the other thing that's so crazy about this is that Roy and and Siegfried, they lived with these animals like the animals lived on their compound, which is just like almost unthinkable. Like I, I, it's so hard to comprehend what it would be like to just wake up every day and be like, I'm going to go have my cereal and hang out with a puma. <laughs> mm, lucky charms. You want some Monte <laughs> uh, But uh, people do it, though. I mean, you know, if anything, we saw that it's definitely not. Sugar Smacks, which have now been renamed to Honey Smacks to remove the stigma of feeding sugar to children because of the woke snowflakes that would put up gates in front of our show for the tigers to separate them from the audience. Spantrew, are you uh, are you saying that's a good thing or a bad thing? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm saying me as Roy. I'm not down with the woke snowflakes. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. Which is also another cereal that I eat. W woke flakes. Yeah. Um, mm, a hearty bowl of woke snowflakes. <laughs> um, so, but this this basically like fundamentally changes their lives, man. Like he, Roy from they they stop performing. Roy takes care of or Siegfried takes care of Roy for the rest of their lives. That's like so heartbreaking and so beautiful and so touching that they really were like like it, I mean yes it was an act but also like they really cared about each other and he like was his nurse for the last like 20 years of his life or 16 years whatever it was so the last video that we're going to listen to today is going to kind of be about how Siegfried and Roy processed what happened with Manticore and how deeply their kayfabe goes uh yesterday Nancy made a big announcement about Siegfried and Roy they are adding three cute white lion cubs <laughs> to their secret garden at the Mirage in Las Vegas yeah they're cute right now because they're little that's right <laughs> well that is why I went to Vegas to meet the cubs for the very first time but when I sat down with Siegfried and Roy, we talked about the incident that left Roy partially paralyzed, and he told me something I have never heard before. When the accident happened, I thought everything is stopped. Now it's not, but now uh, I think we are in a good space. Everything is, is, is a present. I'm thankful to God for every breath I can take. October 3rd, 2003, Roy Horn near death and rushed into emergency surgery. There's been so many different versions that you hear of what actually happened. They're all wrong. They're all wrong. Despite what you may have heard about what happened between Roy and the 600-pound Bengal tiger named Montecore, the men say the truth has never been accurately reported before. He passed out. He passed out on stage. He passed out before the incident. I got, I got a stroke when I fall down and I seen the blue eyes still looking at me. I thought now what happened. So he did what every cat do when she has a little... He picked him up by the neck and brought him, came for me to, to the side for you know. Like you a mother safe. with a cub. Oh yeah, he, he, he uh, took care of me. He said, me, uh, my, my artery is an absolute blessing because that's going to lead to blood pressure. How about you will be brain dead? You're saying the doctor is saying that had Montecore not relieved the pressure, you would not have lived? Yeah, I could have been vegetable. Then I had the operation and to relieve the pressure of pain, which you took the whole top of the head off. And during that time, I had three more strokes. I died clinically three times on the operation table. Wow. And but you're still here on kicking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. 
Roy maintains an amazing attitude, and he never blamed Montecor for what happened. Montecor passed away just about three months ago. And my brother. Your brother. I know you've actually called him your blood brother. Oh, well, yeah. He had my blood and I had his blood. The accident impaired Roy's ability to speak and walk, and he's never regained full use of his left side. But he and Siegfried persevere in their life's mission, helping to save rare wild animals from extinction. Meet these three adorable... <sighs> How much of that are you buying? How much of that are you believing from our boy Roy? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't think that's true at all. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's it's actually, you know, it's 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 interesting because you know, yeah, the the, the kayfabe for sure. It's it, the 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 sheer kayfabe of it all. But also, you know, it's 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 kind of it's actually kind of touching because you know, really, what it is is like it's. You have somebody like Roy, who, as we've explored so far in this episode, he is this this ultimate animal lover. And you can, you know, you you, you can it's debatable whether what they were doing with these animals was ethical um, and maybe, you know, just keeping all these animals in captivity and putting them through these shows or whatever, whatever. like maybe it wasn't the best thing to do. Um, from a from a uh, animal cruelty perspective, I don't know. I th- maybe they had like some crate. Maybe they had some crazy safety protocols, and everything was above board. And even PETA is like, "Yep, we sign off on this." I don't know. I haven't looked into it too much, but you know, aside from that, like we we ex- we explored this whole time that like Roy just he had this this connection with these animals. He loved them uh, almost more than anything in the world, and you know he formed a bond with these animals at a time whenever he was alone and didn't have anybody else, no real human connection. And he formed this bond with the animals in place of that. And this bond was life was, was for a lifetime. And so you have somebody like that who also has this public platform. They are massively famous and they, they have this personal responsibility to represent um, these animals. And I can imagine from his perspective uh, with the level that he cares about the animals that this happens. And the, the thing that's going through his mind is I do not want to create stigma about these animals. I don't want people to start thinking that they're like these cruel, savage creatures where you can raise them for the time that they're a cub and love them. And then they just randomly will kill you or attack you or whatever. I don't want to create this fear. I don't want to create this stigma. You know, whenever Jaws came out, it like increased the percentages of sharks that were killed. Um, it, it, it created this fear of sharks that led to like increased like reports of sharks, which in turn led to like increased killings of sharks. And I guarantee you that that was going through his mind of like, I cannot, I got, I have to, I have to do damage control as like this representative of these animals and these animals interacting with human beings. And this whole thing is this kayfabe crafted to be, be like, no, this wasn't an example of the fact that these wild animals should probably not be kept in captivity. And no matter how much you train them and work with them and live with them and, and love them, and no matter how much they might genuinely love you or care about you, at the end of the day, they have these inborn instincts and they're these massively powerful creatures. And it's just not safe to do this. That's not what happened at all. What happened was he saved me. I had a stroke and he saved my life. He was just trying to carry me like you would a cub. And because I'm not a tiger cub, it just it hurt me. But it wasn't supposed to hurt me. It was supposed to help me. And not only that, but also if he hadn't have bit me and stabbed my neck like that, I would have died because he released this pressure that needed to be released. The whole thing is crafted to be like. No, the opposite of this animal had this like temper tantrum and as a result of being a wild animal in captivity and it got confused and it lashed out because it's a wild animal and you just can't really tame them like fully at the end of the day. No, he was protecting me and he saved my life. And there's something there's something touching about that, that of just like the fact that he crafted this story and committed to it solely because he just did not want to create a stigma or like damage the reputation of the animals. Well, it also, I mean, I think there's a component of it that, that's that, but then there's also, I think a craven, I don't want to look like an idiot. Yeah, I, 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 I would say I would agree with that. Like 
earlier and maybe and maybe he did say that before but i feel like at that stage like this is after the after they're retired they're older um it's it, it was many years after the event um i feel like there's less precedent for that i mean that that's something that you would definitely do you know at the time like you come out of that and you're yeah you're right you like you try to save face you're this professional animal trainer like it, it's it's kind of humiliating that you just a lot you know got into a situation where you got to you're supposed to be you're supposed to be like this great animal tamer or whatever and then you got attacked by a tiger but to craft that story like years after the fact and kind of come out and be like i never told anyone this but in reality he saved my life um yeah i i to, to me i mean I, maybe there's a combination of both or maybe you're right and it is just purely that but that was what i got a, that's what i took away from it was just like this feeling of responsibility of like representing uh, exotic animals yeah. and yeah. not creating um not be not serving as this like avatar for creating fear and further um stigma against these animals kind of you know it's like the thing with like killer whales like the fact that like there 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 are all these deaths where like killer whales have kill, killed trainers um at these different like amusement parks and it's sea world and some of these amusement parks you know in different countries and things like that and it's created this tremendous stigma against killer whales i mean they're literally called killer whales um and they've tried to like re you know f- rebrand them and be like no they're not killer whales they're orca whales um, but there is this stigma against killer whales that they are these vicious creatures. Um, yeah. but it's not actually really their fault. It's the fact that they have been captured and put into tanks like this. Just, this shouldn't happen. This shouldn't be, yeah. be done. Ultimately, Roy Horn died May 8th, 2020 from complications arising from the coronavirus. Only one year later, on January 22nd, 2021, Siegfried announced he had terminal pancreatic cancer and passed away two days later at the age of 81. These woke snowflakes told me to get the vaccine, but I'm not putting that in my body. Yeah, I, I, as we've said repeatedly through the show, prior to this, us choosing to do this episode, I, I didn't know too much about them. But now I count myself under the uh, Roy's boys. I I love them. I'm way into them, and um, and uh, I I I I really re- respect their uh, garish, extreme lifestyles in in every sense of those words. Um, yeah, I kind of had some stuff I wanted to talk with you about, just in terms of like as a creative person, knowing when enough is enough. You know, like knowing when to when your time to get off the stage or to stop a certain project or a certain thing uh when when it's time because i feel like that definitely was a component of this where they were like in the winding down stage where they if they had just like known a little bit better and i think it's funny too because i think the the like colloquial term for that is the showman's instinct is to know when to get off stage and like i'm not even saying that they didn't know but i think that it is something to discuss yeah, I mean, it, 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 that it's interesting that the that creative drive that hyper normalizes certain um, expectations of yourself, and then it's hard for you to let that go or allow yourself to be um, uh, allow yourself to be f- uh, absolved of it. Um, you know, kind of going back to the thing where I forget what the original thing was, but they 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 were they were doing X amount of shows per per week or whatever, and then they they, they decided to like as they were getting a little bit older, they decided to like chill out a little bit and, and take it down to only eight shows. Uh, what was it? Was it eight shows a week or eight shows? Eight a- shows a week. I think they were doing 14 shows a week prior. And it's funny. Cause I, I totally, I totally get that. I get, I get that idea of like 14 shows was insane and like so ridiculous that you were doing that. And even eight shows is still a lot, but I totally get that idea that because you had been accomplishing this thing for so long and you were you were so you were accomplishing this thing at such a high level and then a- any any decrease of that would be seen as a failure to you no matter how reasonable it was and no matter how much of a toll it was taking on you and no matter how much everybody else is like no it's okay like eight shows a week is great that's still a lot you should probably do three like jesus christ but you yourself are always just going to feel like like you you're failing or you you are fucking up because you like once once you've got get get to that level and you're and you're accomplishing that then that's like the baseline and that is what you have committed your life to every like waking second 
And so to ever, to ever like minimize that or scale it back is like, you're not accomplishing. You're, you're, you're failing. You're, you're no longer what your identity is. You know, you're, you're no longer well, especially achieving. Especially too, is like, especially too, cause like they're, they're, you know, they're in their like sixties and seventies doing this stuff. And there was pure, you know, the, the way that a lot of their tricks worked is that they would drop down to a layer beneath the stage and then have to run and then pop up like 20 feet away, you know, through the stage. And like, it's hard to do that as a young person, let alone as somebody who maybe is starting to have a little bit of physical decline. Another thing that we hadn't talked about, which I saw in multiple kind of documentary things about them, is that they were both actually not that tall. So they wore four inch boots on stage and then they had like two inch risers in their shoes hidden. So they were basically performing all of their stunts in stilettos. They were, they were on five inch stiletto basically yeah yeah and so they like they were doing all of these stunts on their toes for 40 years that's crazy so they both had like a bunch of knee issues because of that and so they couldn't really do it which is why they started i think roy had like three different knee surgeries which is why they scaled down from 14 to to eight performances a week but that's just wild. I th- that that actually the topic of them on the heels and then also Roy's cod pieces. Siegfried didn't wear the cod pieces. Roy did. There's so much weird Freudian stuff happening in their shows based on their costuming and their like th- being insecure about their height is one thing. Like who gives a shit how tall you are? Like I guess maybe that maybe that matters for the lions. I guess I I don't know. Like is that an insecurity thing or is that? They needed to be physically imposing over the lions till they would get respect from the lions. I don't know. But like Roy's cod pieces are there's it's very it's very apparent that he is insecure about something. I don't know what it is, but there's there's some stuff going on there. Yeah. 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 I mean, and yeah, I I think that people a lot of people just don't understand the the feeling of of like that idea of winding down like this this happens to everybody but i i think about this a lot and i'm like man it would be it would be so it would be so tragic to be like an athlete where you you, like the window of your of your career and your skill is like limited you're just Mm -hmm. like yeah you're you're like a football player or whatever and it's like yeah you can like you can play for like 10 years or something and then you're just like done because you've just like battered your body and you're like old and you just can't physically do it anymore and that happens to everybody but like with athletes it's like it's like way expedited it's like you have such a small you just have a such a small window of time when you can do the thing that you like spent your entire life having passion for and building towards um but yeah for anybody when it, whenever you have that that drive like I, th- I think a lot of people just don't understand that like it's not just like oh i need to take it easy it's not just like oh i'm getting a little older and i need to like it's like you are you are like forsaking your entire existence this is what i do this is what i am and now i like can't i'm gonna do it less now like that i that yeah it, it it's Especially whenever you get to this level, whenever you're whenever you're doing a, an insane amount, these these ridiculous shows that are so over the top and getting paid more money than like anybody in your family has ever even dreamt of getting paid. Yeah, that's just it's that's probably so it's probably so devastating to deal with coming to grips with having to like even think about like, oh, I'm going to have to like stop doing this soon. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I've kind of made all the points that I wanted to make. Um, Andrew, do you have, or Spandrew, do you have any? Yeah, I feel like I've kind of made all of the points that I wanted to make. Spandrew, do you have any uh, closing thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this is a closing thought, maybe because it really is not, it's not like a summation or anything like that. But I did, I did, I was thinking about the the aspect of of their relationship and kind of just the weird dynamic that you see in all of the media about them even from the more recent interviews like even from the stuff that was like in like 2014 when they were kind of being like re- interviewed and like looking back on the accidents and stuff like that even in those there's this weird kind of thing where it's like nobody is acknowledging that these are two gay men that are in like a long-term relationship they say it in these like very vague ways like you got your your relationship and and even they don't like acknowledge it and you can see that that's co- that's from like years of just like being scared of acknowledging it and the the stigma about it 
like they've built these these barriers and these defense mechanisms of like the way that they'll dance around it and skirt around it because you know their whole careers they've had to like not talk about it openly um and so you have all these interviews where just nobody's acknowledging this thing that's just blatantly obviously true um but it's also interesting that you look back on it and it's like there were these huge, massive celebrities. And the same thing goes for like Liberace or or or, or Elton John, um, where it's like they're 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 gay. But there's weirdly almost like there was less focus on that or less like there wasn't some big controversy around it. It was it was more like in this weird way. It was well, more it was the- more accepted than it like to today like these things with identity politics are so politicized that like when there there's there's a lot more dis- openness about these things but there's also way, a lot more backlash against them like when somebody's openly gay in the public consciousness there's all this backlash and a lot of that is just purely politic- politicization where the reason why people are mad about these things is largely because they're told that they need to be mad about it because it's become such a topic of discussion that now people are watch listening to podcasts and watching things like watching and they're telling them like oh like the going back to my joke like oh these woke people are trying to like force this stuff down your throat like you should be mad about this and some people are like mad about it because it's like it's it's been manifested into reality that this idea that they should care about it and they should be mad about it and weirdly, like there was less of that back then because it wasn't so politicized. But also, I think the key thing is the reason why it wasn't so politicized and the reason why there wasn't as much of a focus on it was because it was like, all right, fine. We, we've gone through decades of of cultural evolution. And for a while, we were telling you, like, you can't do that. If you do it, you're going to go to jail or somebody's going to beat you up or whatever. And you just can't talk about it fine like you can you can kind of talk about it like you can just you can be out in the open and kind of you don't have to hide it but you can't like you have to do it on our terms like you can't say it like explicitly you have to like even though it's two men even though it's two men holding hands with a cat dressed in full-on spandex with with like crystal uh crystal staves beaming light at everyone <laughs> you can't say it you can't say it that's what makes it even weirder because it's like we love you and we're 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 into this but just don't remind us that you're gay yeah don't don't say the words i smooch roy yeah and we'll we'll bask in we'll bask in the clear gayness of you and love every second of it but we just don't want you to tell us that it is gayness. We just want to believe that it's some weird. That's so, that's a, such a good point though. Yes. I love the way you phrase that. We'll bask in the gayness as long as you don't tell us that it's gayness because like a heteronormative perception of gayness is just theatricality. If you take the gayness out of the theater, then we have to grapple. Then the straight world has to grapple with like, Oh, gay. Uh, I don't know. But in the, in the world of the theater, it creates a permission structure to be like, Oh, well, it's just two male performers who are wearing sequins and neon pink spandex uniforms and have feathered hair and are embracing each other while being lifted up into the air under a spotlight that's just it's just theater it's just theater it's not gay it's theater yeah and because of that permission structure or that paradigm it was like weirdly almost like more accepted i mean i'm not saying that like certainly at a ground level you know there being gay was not accepted like there was tons of violence and a lot of discrimination, but from a pop cultural perspective, like nobody was out there like writing angry blogs about Siegfried and Roy being gay or whatever. Whereas now people will, you know, they're, they will be open about it. They, you know, that they're, they're no longer willing to like live within that paradigm where they'll just like, we, you know, we'll just, we're not going to say it or whatever. Like now yeah. it's like we say it and now people are, now it's like people are mad because it's like, no, that's not, that wasn't the deal. We said you could do it, but you just couldn't talk about it. And now people are talking about it and now people are protesting in the streets even though it's no different it's just it, you just you, you've manifested a problem into reality that didn't exist for no real reason other than just it makes you uncomfortable or something to be confronted with it and on that note i'm dave baker and i'm spandrew spice you can find me online at heydavebaker.com uh you can find my books 
Night Hunters, Everyone is Tulip, Star Trek Voyager 7's Reckoning, and Fuck Off Squad. Spandrew, where can people find you on the internet? You can find me on stage, surrounded by the most exotic of animals. Cascading around me are the, the lights and the billowing cloth that's flying around and encapsulating us and floating over us and creating a, a panoply of color. And I'm just in the middle of the stage wearing the largest cod piece you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> does the cod piece have an eye patch? The cod piece does have an eye patch. Um, and and uh, honestly, you can't find me on social media. I'm not much of a social media guy. I don't I don't get on much. I have a, I have a Facebook page that I mostly use just to talk in the Deep Cuts Facebook group. But in memory of our in memory of our fallen friend i guess you could go to dipricerights.com and you can still buy andrew's book deadbolt ai private eye um and you can also uh you can check the deep cuts show out by going to deepcutspod.com or following us on social media on facebook at deep cuts podcast you can join the deep cuts podcast facebook group where we talk about the show and make memes and hillsmer's always in there just shitting on the listeners um, you can follow us on Instagram at Deep Cuts Pod. You can follow us on TikTok at Mystery Treehouse. You can get some Deep Cuts merch by going to deepcutspod.com and clicking on the shop, or you can just go to bitly.com slash deep cuts merch. I think that's it. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content. The incidental music for this episode was created by D. Catalano, whose music can be found at wekeepoddhours.bandcamp.com.